This week, a class on how pilgrims became part of the United States' founding story in 19th century history textbooks. Professor Abram Van Eggen of Washington University describes why early historians and educators emphasized the Pilgrims' Plymouth Colony over earlier settlements, such as Jamestown in Virginia. So insofar as Jamestown appears on any map in our history, it appears as, as uh, associated with slavery, right? Which is why it's not a t- she doesn't want it to be a turning point in American history. Because if it's the turning point in American history, you can't not talk about slavery. <laughs> More after this. The goal today is to think about how the Pilgrims and the Puritans, who we've been talking about all course long, uh, became such a national part of our heritage, such a huge part of our history. What happened? How do we get from the fact of their coming to these annual remembrances, like at Thanksgiving, uh, and to the important place of them in political speeches, Reagan's calling us a city on a hill because a Puritan called us a city on a hill, uh, because the pilgrims came here and so forth. How do we get from one place to the next? And the way we get there is through the work of history. So what we're going to be looking at today is after the United States becomes an independent nation, what happens to the development of historical writing? That is, how, do his, how does historical writing take off How does it focus on certain national narratives? Where do they develop and what happens to maintain them and really to disseminate them to a wide population, okay? We talked last time, we talked before about Ernest Renan, about collective memory, about this idea that nations have a kind of what's called temporal depth, right? This idea that uh, part of what makes a nation a nation is the idea of shared memories, and part of those shared memories is forgetting other memories, right? Forgetting other aspects of history in order to cohere around a kind of story. So we talked about this this whole part of collective memory and its relation to nationalism. Here, in a certain sense today, what we're going to do is see it at work. Uh, And that's what this, this lecture today is about. All right, so just to review where we've come from and where we're headed next. We've talked, this course, course on American exceptionalism, we've talked about definitions of it, and just to uh, review this sort of dual part to it, right, the passive sense of American exceptionalism, which is a kind of model, right? So in this definition, the position assumes that the U.S. has in some way achieved what other nations are seeking, or that the U.S. is called to achieve, and so to model to others what other nations are seeking. But not, in a certain sense, to intervene, right? This is the passive model. Uh, the active model, this idea that the U.S. has been sent on a mission, right? Position assumes that our calling is to spread our blessings, and those can be defined in any number of ways. But some of the ways they get defined is as religious liberty, self-government, capitalism, free enterprise. And part of the idea of this course is to see when those ideas get attached to American exceptionalism, right? Uh, but to, the idea is that our call is to spread these things to the rest of the world, so it's more of an active um, sense. And usually, both of these senses, either of these senses, can include a religious sense of chosenness, that we are called, that is, someone, some divinity has called us to this position, or set us apart, right, to be a model. So there's often embedded in American exceptionalism a kind of religious sensibility of chosenness. What does it entail? Well, on the one hand, of course, it entails a kind of comparative assessment, right? So if you say that the U.S. is unique, what you're saying is, I have looked at other countries compared the U.S. to other countries, and in X detail or Y detail, it is unique. So there's a comparative assessment that always comes uh, in American exceptionalism. More particularly, though, for our class uh, and for what we're talking about today, there's usually embedded a historical claim that is either implicitly or explicitly claims about America's unique virtues or benefits usually entail claims about America's past. That is how we came to have those unique virtues or this distinct national purpose in the world. And this is where collective memory uh, comes to play such an important part. This is the part of American exceptionalism we're going to be spending our time on uh, today. All right. So, obviously, the U.S. has this revolution, declares independence, uh, makes it stick, Treaty of Paris, ratification of the Constitution. Now you've got this situation, right? You've got all these colonies which were connected immediately to England suddenly connected immediately to each other. They're one nation, right? Uh, Except that, for a long time, they have not really seen each other as one nation. So now you've got this 
problem, which is how do you formulate a national identity for all these different colonies with all these different cultures and say we're in fact one nation, right? And that is the work of cultural nationalism. Uh, and it's called cultural nationalism because it takes cultural work to build up a national identity. It takes cultural embedding, texts and speech and civic rites and rituals to create this identity. There's three uh, distinct ways I'm going to look at here. There's more, of course, that could be said. But three features in the rise of nationalism right after the revolution and the beginning of the nation uh, that we can think about. First is the idea of maps. That is, we can know that we're one nation if we're pictured as one nation. And what you begin to see happen in the early republic and in the early days of the new nation is you see maps show up everywhere. Everybody keeps drawing the map of this one nation with one set of political boundaries over and over and over. This happens, they hang it on the walls in taverns, they put it on teacups. If you're surrounded by this map of yourself in relation to all these others, right, then you will begin to perceive yourself as one with all these others. So maps become one way of thinking about a national union and a national identity. Um, and, of course, part of what we're talking about here, we, we raised this Benedict Anderson before, the idea of an imagined community. How do you imagine yourself in community with people you will never meet, uh, people that you have never met, people that you know very little about, and yet suddenly you're one people with them, right? And maps are one way to imagine yourself as one people. The other thing that happens is rights. So you get the celebration of the 4th of July, for example, Right? And this begins to happen all over the place with civic speeches and so forth. And so you, in a, in a certain sense, practice yourself as one people. If everybody in all 13 colonies is practicing the 4th of July, they are, in effect, embedding the sense of themselves as one people united across the colonies. Right? So maps is, is one way, rights is one way, and then the last way, again, the way we're going to focus on today, history. You write the story of yourself as one people. You remember yourself as one people, right? Uh, so maps, rights, and history are ways of embedding or creating a kind of cultural identity. And so, unsurprisingly, what you see happen is suddenly the rise of historical societies. Now, most people don't think too much about historical societies, uh, and yet they played this really important role in the early republic. So the first historical society was the Massachusetts Historical Society, Founded in 1791, uh, it's in Boston still today. Uh, and for our purposes, which is partly we're thinking about the rise of that city on a hill sermon and how it went from Winthrop to Reagan, right? Well, this is the society that first prints it. Remember we talked about how no Puritan knew about this sermon in its own day. Uh, it was never printed, it was never remarked upon. Nobody knew that Winthrop gave this sermon. Uh, there's no record of it, right? They find it in 1838. Where do they find it? In another historic, the second historical society, in the New York Historical Society. That's where it still is today. Uh, they find it there, and they send a, a copy of it to Massachusetts, which is the first place where it gets printed. Now, what you see happening in that basic development there is something more broadly happening, which is that these are societies founded to preserve American history and pass it on. Why are they founded right after the Revolution and the Constitution, because what they're saying is American history, first of all, is a thing, and second of all, it's a thing we ought to preserve, and third of all, it's so important a thing that all the other nations of the world are going to want to know our history, so let's go ahead and collect it, house it, keep it, publish it, right? Um, and that's why you begin to see these places abound. The other thing that happens with these historical societies, and we're going to see a bit more of this later in the lecture, is there's a kind of sectionalism to them. That is to say, Boston and New York are not the same places, right? And Boston's material is not the same material as New York. And so you see the sort of early celebration of pilgrims in, and the Puritans and so forth in Boston. Who do you think they're celebrating in New York in the earliest days of this historical society? Who are they celebrating? They have their big gala to kind of open their doors, and they say, we want to hold it on the anniversary of what? Yeah. People like Hamilton or something? Hamilton gets remembered in, in terms of everybody's remembering the revolution, for sure. But who, where, where do the New York founding go back to? Yeah. It's like Stuyvesant. Stuyvesant. Where's Stuyvesant from? Netherlands. Netherlands. The Dutch, right? So their first big gala is in actually in 1809 to celebrate the 200 years since Henry Hudson 
right? Uh, and the coming of the Dutch. And so you see the ways in which these historical societies have a kind of regional flair to them, right? New York Historical Society begins by celebrating the Dutch, and they say, oh, yes, of course, the Puritans and the Pilgrims and those people too, sure. Uh, but we're, we're the Dutch, you know? Uh, and each place begins to kind of emphasize its own history as part of the national story, right? Um, we're going to come back to this term in a little bit, but what you get, what you begin to evolve here is what one historian has called sectional nationalism. That is, that my section is the sort of essential section of the nation for the nation, right? If you want to know about American national history, you first have to know about my section of the nation, right? We're the most important part. Uh, and so you get that sense of sectional nationalism. Well, uh, by the time that the American Historical Association is founded in 1884, 200 of these societies had been opened uh, across the various um, states. And actually, some of the biggest and strongest and most well-supported ones were here in the Midwest. So in Wisconsin and Iowa and such places, they really wanted to collect and know uh, their histories. The state supported these things. All right, so what's the significance of these things? Well, one of the things I said is uh, they collect the history. But even in the idea that Reagan is citing Winthrop Sermon, what you begin to understand is that these sort of unthought of, unknown places, like historical societies, are all embedded in the way we tell our nation's story. So think about this, right? Reagan cannot call America a city on a hill without, in effect, the sermon being found. How is the sermon found? Historical societies keep it and find it and print it, right? Which is to say that the language of American politics embodies far more than just a set of beliefs or policy positions. It also contains a whole history of these libraries, these historical societies, these archives, and so on, right? Uh, all sorts of individuals and institutions that have collected, preserved, and passed on stories of our nation's past. Here's the imp other important part to think about, though. Archives, as much as they preserve, they also select. When these people went about founding archives, they thought, this is important, this is not important, right? Uh, just to give you a sense of this, there's a really important uh, early Native American intellectual leader and preacher named Sansa Mockham, right? Well, uh, Jeremy Belknap, who founds the Massachusetts Historical Society, totally dismisses this guy, right? He, does, he, he treats him with total disrespect. So, Ockham's papers never end up in the Massachusetts Historical Society, right? They're, they're located later. Other people come back and say, wait a second, this, is, this guy's important. We need to collect this guy's papers, right? In other words, preservation is selection. Preservation is, just to get back to Renan's quote, in remembering there is forgetting, right? Um, so uh, they preserve and they select. And so in the choices that they make, they shape not only what we do say about America's past, but what we can say about America's past. Because if you want to tell the story, you've got to go find the texts and the records. Well... All you've got available are the texts and the records that have been preserved, right? Um, so this is the kind of significance of these historical societies and archives. Okay, well, it's one thing to save everything. It's one thing to preserve everything. But then how does the public get to know anything? And what you see is early on what these folks are doing is they're saying, look, what we're going to do is we're going to collect all the records. We're going to keep all the stuff. And later, historians can tell the story. So in other words, they divided these two things, these two jobs up. Uh, they, they said, you know what, somebody else could put it all together into a grand narrative. As long as they've got the stuff, we're going to keep the stuff. Well, that begins to happen. So uh, there's a new interest in history that gradually rises. So in each decade from 1790 to 1830, historical works, including historical fiction, accounted for a quarter or more of America's bestsellers, climbing to a peak of more than 85% in the 1820s. The 1820s is when you see this real, true burst of interest in American history. Uh, well, in addition to that, you have these new state laws. So um, the state laws are not only that people have to go to school, but that when they go to school, they have to study American history, right? So there's already this kind of push on the state level to study history. Uh, because of the state laws, because of the burgeoning population, you just have tons more students. So this is a, a handy little statistic to demonstrate this. In New York alone, the number of school children grew from 176,000 in 1816 to 508,000 in 1833. That's just 17 years later, right? Yeah, 17. Uh, so that's an enormous growth, right, of, of just pure number of students. 
And unsurprisingly, then, the market for new American history textbooks suddenly booms, right? So gross sales of American-produced textbooks from 1820 to 1855 increased from 750,000 to 5.5 million, outperforming the nearest genre of book by over 5 to 1. That is, textbooks are what's selling in early America. Um, of course, that includes more than just history textbooks, but history textbooks are a big part of this genre. Well, if you write a textbook, you've got to decide where you're going to start. <laughs> where does the story of America begin? And remember, this is the question we asked on the first day of class. Where do you begin the story of America? What's the origin of America? And we looked at a variety of different answers to that question that a person could come up with, right? You could start with Native Americans, Columbus, Jamestown, Mayflower, the Declaration, the Revolution. Remember that each of these answers has an implication about what you mean by America, right? Each of these answers, if you start with Native Americans as the beginning of America, you've got a much broader sense of diversity of all the people who've ever lived here, unbounded by any certain political geography or boundaries, right? Um, Columbus means that America, as we know it today, begins with Europeans encountering Native Americans, right? Or the discovery from a European point of view of America. Uh, the Jamestown answer, of course, emphasizes English roots to however we define America. And the Declaration, of course, is the nation. And then we ask this question about how come the Pilgrims and the Puritans are on this list at all? We've heard this story many times. We hear it every Thanksgiving. And yet, when we come to think about this as an origin of America, it doesn't make a lot of sense. They're not the first people here. They're not the first Europeans here. They're not the first English people here. They're not the first English settlement here, right? So what makes them a kind of origin, right? Um, well, one of the reasons why they become this sort of influential and important origin is because they could be used to give America a sort of noble identity or a noble cause, right? So we hear that the pilgrims came for freedom or for God or for self-government or for all three of those things. And because they came for those reasons, that's what America stands for ever since, right? And because that kind of language could be given to the pilgrims much more easily than it could be given to, say, Jamestown, then Jamestown gets sort of moved aside or erased or ignored so that we could start with the pilgrims and be committed to these things as our essential identity. Uh, and so what you see often happening is that you get this kind of contrast built in, right? Well, when the pilgrims came, it was unlike when the Spanish came, because what the Spanish did was totally horrible. But what the pilgrims did is they came for this, right? That's what defines America. Or you could say, well, yeah, I mean, people came to Virginia, but I mean, that was just a... Uh, those are people... Who, we're, we're sort of bad settlers, right? Uh, and that's not what America stands for. That's not the true origin of America. That happened, but the real origin came just a little bit later, right? And so you get this way of talking about American history so that identity and origin are mixed up in purpose. Does that make sense? All right. The other reason we get to talk about the pilgrims as an origin of America is because the people who write the textbooks happen to be mostly from New England. And this gets back to the kind of sectionalism built into national history, right? By 1860, New England was only 10% of the U.S. population. But it was roughly half of all textbook writers, right? Um, that dominance gave them a key role in shaping the story of America that would come out. Um, and this is going back all the way to the Puritans themselves. The Puritans themselves would frequently write history and write history of themselves and of New England. Uh, so this was a long tradition in New England of writing histories. From the 17th century well into the 20th century, New England's dominated American historical writing. Why do we talk about the Pilgrims and the Puritans so much? Because the people who write history happen to come mostly from New England in the 19th century. Right? Uh, that's one, one sort of reason. All right. So then you get these massive commemorations of the pilgrims. Um, and we looked at these slides before, so I'm going to go very quickly through these. But this is just to remind you, these sorts of images, these sorts of poems begin to emerge en masse in the 19th century, right? So Felicia Hammond's Landing of the Pilgrim Fathers in New England, 
And the last stanza, call it holy ground, the soil where first they trod. They have left unstained what there they found, freedom to worship God. Right? So you get this sense in which the coming of the pilgrims began something totally new in the world. And what that newness was had to do with religion, religious liberty, civil liberty, all the ways you can put together freedom and God <laughs> began with the pilgrims and the Puritans in New England, right? This thing totally new. Uh, and so, of course, you get also all these paintings, right, that celebrate them. We looked at these paintings before and what we saw in them, this sort of religious dimension, the, the, the light, the heavenly light shining on the Mayflower Compact, or a more civil liberty version, right, where it's mostly with each other, this compact, this idea of self-government uh, in the Mayflower, or this sort of noble and heroic and yet domestic and agricultural sense of origins. Uh, and, of course, these other sort of famous, the landing of the fathers, right? The fathers are our fathers, are the beginnings of our people, right? Um, and, of course, all the way up through 1914, the first Thanksgiving uh, and images of a kind of peaceful settlement, right? To be contrasted with others. You also get these pilgrim societies. So what these... New England societies and pilgrim societies do. Basically, we talked about if civic rights are one way to build a national identity, civic rights can also be one way to spread a regional identity. So you get New England societies developing in places like New York and Charleston and all over the place. And what they are is basically everyone from New England gets together, especially if you're wealthy and male, and you get together and celebrate the fact that you're from New England. Right? And how are you going to celebrate the fact that you're from New England? Well, you're basically going to remember the pilgrims. That's how you celebrate the fact that you're from New England. And so they would have these elaborate feasts uh, in December to celebrate Pilgrim Landing and the Mayflower Compact and so on and so forth. Every December they'd get together and celebrate uh, anew their Pilgrim origins. And here's one certificate of membership in the Pilgrim Society. So you get this sort of contrast, always this sort of contrast, the wilderness, the developed town, the Native American before, the English civilization after. Uh, coming with, with uh, pilgrims, right? All right. So, commemorations uh, become all important. And just to, just to make sure that we're, it's not, we're overemphasized, there's lots of commemorations going on. So think about um, what else is being commemorated in the 1820s. In 1825, you commemorate Bunker Hill. In 1826, 50 years since the Declaration of Independence. Anyone know who dies? 1826, same day, July 4, 1826. It's uh, John Adams and, why? Wow, he's like an incredibly famous guy. Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, that incredibly famous dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So July 4, 1826, on the, very, on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, old arch rivals, second and third president, both die. Uh, and you have all of these speeches celebrating, of course, the revolution, the declaration, right? So commemoration through the 1820s is a big, booming business. There are speeches and memorials and commemorations all the time. This is, again, the building of a public history, right? Memorials and monuments are super important. It's how a people makes their identity and remembers it in all of these civic rituals, in all of these ways of sort of building a cultural identity. Well, one of those commemorations happens in 1820, because, of course, it's 200 years since the landing of the pilgrims. So, in, one thing to keep in mind is up until 1820, the pilgrims were celebrated, but mostly in New England. That is, if you're from Charleston, you're like, the pilgrims who? Like, why is this, why is this important to me, right? Um, and by 18, in 1820, partly through the work of this guy, Daniel Webster, the pilgrims start to become nationalized. They start to become a kind of national origin story. And this speech that he gives in 1820 is uh, one of the ways that begins to happen. So, uh, Daniel Webster, anybody remember who Daniel Webster is? You guys covered Daniel Webster before? Zach, you're feeling, feeling Daniel Webster? Okay. <laughs> So this guy was super important, major orator, senator, right? Uh, he's, he's, his uh, sort of infamy is that he signs off eventually in 1850 on the Fugitive Slave Law. And doing that, he becomes the great traitor of New England. And that, of course, leads to Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1851, right? Uh, so 
that's sort of where he ends. He dies in 1852, shortly after that. In 1820, though, he's still very much on the rise. He's this very important senator, um, speaker, um, House representative, lawyer. He's super important on various uh, Supreme Court cases uh, throughout this period. Uh, and he's known as sort of the great orator of the North. So he's the great speech baker of the North. So if you have the big commemoration ceremony, you're going to ask the best speaker to speak. Uh, and, of course, he does, he does his job. Um, what he does is basically he rewrites the history of America through the pilgrims. And what he does is he imagines the spread of their virtues, what they gave us, etc., transmitted from air to air to air to air, all the way from the Atlantic to the Pacific. He does both of those things in this speech, right? So he closes his speech by imagining the voice of acclamation and gratitude commencing on the rock of Plymouth, transmitted through millions of the sons of the pilgrims till it loses itself in the murmurs of the Pacific seas, right? So he gives this incredible oration. In fact, one person comes away from it and says, it was like uh, his face was shining like the gods, you know, like Moses, and he's, my whole head was going to explode with the rush of excitement. John Adams reads this speech and he says, this is the, the, the best speech he's ever read. He says, uh, it's going to be read 500 years from now. It should be read at the end of every year. It should be reread. should be sent to all the schools. And, of course, it does end up getting sent to all the schools. So one of the things you have as well is the, the sense in which the pilgrims are the origin of America because, as they say in this, as he says in this speech, the moment they arrived, democracy arrived with them. The moment they arrived, Christian institutions came with them. And so you see this sense of an origin as a kind of pure origin, the moment of arrival as the sort of key step, the key beginning in the whole history of America. Uh, and he, of course, sketches that forward all the way to the present day. What you see happen after that is the spread of all this stuff through education, all right? Um, and education is this important way of thinking about how do you get ideas from someone like just a speaker and a speech, like Webster's, to a much broader population or public, right? Uh, well, one of the ways you do that is through education and through a uh, textbook. And one of the first sort of histories of America, even though it's this sort of pilgrim-centered history of America, is Webster's. And so what you begin to see happen is Webster's speech is sent around to schools, mainly in New England, but school children read it, uh, they memorize sections of it, they recite it. This is how they come to know their history, right? Uh, so this is one of the sort of important moments um, transmitting his version of America to a broader population. All right. So what we're going to talk about for a little while now is the this, this sense of the importance of education in this period. So one of the things that happens, this is really important to think about, okay? The Founding Fathers, people like Daniel Webster, those folks, what they often said, uh, even arch rivals like John Adams and Jeff Thomas Jefferson agreed on this, is that liberty and learning go hand in hand. That you basically, you will not be able to maintain liberty in a republic if the people themselves are uninformed. And so... This is the idea they keep talking about called an informed citizenry. You've got to have an informed citizenry. If you don't have an informed citizenry, the whole experiment is going to collapse. Okay? Let me just give you a vivid example of that. Um, there's a guy named Ebenezer Hazard. Great name. Uh, he goes around the south. He's collecting records here, there, and everywhere. Right? Uh, and... What he's doing is he's sort of, he's working with Jeremy Belknap, that founder of the MHS, to collect state archives. Well, he writes a letter in 1778 to Continental Congress, and he says, look, we got no archives here, right? We got nothing to collect these papers, uh, no place to house them, no place to publish them, no place to keep them. If you help me out, I'll go do that work. Continental Congress considers his letter and grants him $1,000, uh, which is a lot of money in those days, to go do this, right? And it also says to all the sort of state representatives along the way, look, help this guy out, make copies of records. Copies, by the way, are hand copies, right? Ebenezer Hazard is, is going to make these things and he's copying them out by hand, right? Um, but think about that. It's 1778. The American Revolution is not yet over. The Treaty of Paris is 1783. So basically, in the midst of the war itself, Continental Congress is like, we need to give 
a federal grant for historical archives <laughs> to keep these papers, right? They're, that's one of the things they're thinking about. When the Massachusetts Historical Society is founded, it's chartered as a public utility, like your gas, <laughs> right? They're thinking about this stuff as public utility, as essential benefits, as absolutely necessary for the maintenance of liberty. Liberty and learning went hand in hand for these people. Yeah, Zach. Where was the Continental Congress getting revenue to fund this kind of thing? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Because the other thing we don't know is whether this thousand dollars ever got from the Continental Congress to the uh, to Ebenezer Hazard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, where is the money actually coming from, right? Um, but the point is, they take this letter in. They say this is important. We need to support this, right? Um, all right. So here's uh, basically Webster's point to that effect. He says, "We confidently trust that by the diffusion of general knowledge." and good and virtuous sentiments, the political fabric may be secure, as well against open violence and overthrow, as against the slow but sure undermining of licentiousness. Licentiousness to them meant um, basically everybody doing whatever they want, right? Um, Now, one of the important things to consider is that Webster is a Whig. uh, And Webster, as a Whig, does not exactly trust the mass population, right? Uh, And so... Um, here you can see this sort of mentality of saying, look, we've got, to, we've got to have learned leaders, but we also have to have an informed citizenry, and we can't just let everybody go off and do whatever they want, right? Uh, that's, that's a sure way to end this thing in disaster, right? Um, all right, so one of the questions to think about here is um, to what extent that still applies, To what extent do you think a kind of uh, informed citizenry is necessary for the maintenance of liberty or democracy or any of the rest of it? I don't want to spend too much time thinking about this because in a certain sense it's a very broad question, right? I mean, it's it's a kind of question that that leaders often think about uh, and there's lots of different ways to go. But if there's a general kind of sense of what you guys talked about, I'd love to just hear some of the sort of immediate thoughts that you had in relation to this question can democracy survive without an informed citizenry? If it requires an informed citizenry, what is the information that's needed? That is, what should education include? Should that inc- education include history? And if so, what kind of history should it emphasize or include? So what were some of the sort of immediate thoughts you guys had or gut reactions to these questions? Yeah. Um, well, we kind of talked about how with democracy, something that's essential is like the government having the consent of the go- governed to be a government. Um, and like part of that consent is education about what people are voting on, what people, like their civic duty is in that sense. And so at least at the bare minimum, there needs to be education about like the things, how people can participate in the democracy. And part, a lot of that comes from the development of the like American democracy. So that was kind of what we were talking about. So basic classes in like civics, like... Or like the uh, School of House Rock, how does a bill become a law, <laughs> right? Uh, or basically, how do you go about participating in this thing we have called the government? Um, yeah, Zach? So we agreed that education is important for the survival of American democracy. And I think we kind of had two big points. The first is that you know, we don't have democracy everywhere in the world. So there's something that's going on here that's working. And we need to be able to recognize what that is, why it's working, and what would be the signs if it was starting to fail or erode. And uh, for us, we talked a lot about the Constitution. And the first thing that people think about when they hear the Constitution is the Bill of Rights. And don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is great. Um, but the Constitution's a lot more than the Bill of Rights. Um, and there are a lot of things in the Constitution that, prevent, that protect uh, individual liberty uh, and freedom. I think we talked about like checks and balances, the separation of powers, a bicameral legislature, federalism, all of these things we think are crucial to America. All right, so, so again, a kind of sense of like, everybody should read the Constitution and figure out how this thing is supposed to be put together. Uh, yeah, Rachel. Um, we also talked about how, like, there's this general saying that, like, when you don't talk about history, like, it repeats itself or like, mm-hmm. people forget certain things. So mm-hmm. I think, um, especially given, like, the timing and, like, the American Revolution, like, they were trying to preserve these things in the <coughs> fighting a war that, like, nobody ever thought that they would win. Um, and so the fact that, that was so important to them that they wanted to preserve like certain aspects of their history. Um, I think shows that like they really didn't want what had happened like with the tyranny and like King George and all of that stuff. They didn't want it repeating itself, and like we still talk about that today. 
Um, but today, things are, like, the, the citizens are informed very differently. Um, people, like, read the news on their phone, and that's what they, like, base their decisions off. So I think there's, like, this idea that we have to keep history alive, but it's just kept alive a very different way today. Yeah, well, and, and thinking about the way people inform themselves today, right? We're very aware of misinformation now, right? The idea that you could be, it could be a fake article or a fake whatever on Facebook, right? That leads you, I'm not going to say fake news because there's, there's real news uh, that is really done by real experts and so forth. But anyway, uh, but this idea that information and misinformation do go uh, hand in hand. Well, this is true back then too, right? Thinking about uh, how do you trust a source, right? So maybe one of the things people need to be educated in is how do I know when to trust a source, right? How do I know when to trust uh, what I'm hearing, right? Thinking through that kind of scrutiny. Yeah, Jacob? Uh, people must be made to understand that if you want to be an informed person, then you must uh, take the responsibility to be informed, to read many books, many articles, just sit down with a cup of coffee and just start Reading, don't complain about it, don't make <laughs> excuses to weasel your way out of reading, because if you do, then you are useless. You know, if you aren't willing to actually do the work and put in the effort, then you know, it's uh, just all talk. Right, so I think one of the other things your, your point is raising, though, is what is the balance between individual responsibility to be an informed citizen and the kind of systems or structures that we can have in place so as to inform people as they're growing up and as they're becoming a citizen in this nation, right? What kinds of systems or structures are in place? To just think about this very simply, in the era in which we're talking about, common schooling becomes state law, right? So you have to go to school to learn some basic things, right? And they're beginning to think about, well, what are those basic things that everybody has to know, right? Well, as you begin to pass the laws that send people to school, you've got to begin to think about what are they ought to be learning in those schools, right? And these are the kinds of questions that they're shaping at this particular moment. Yeah, one more. Yeah, what we were talking about is that, like, the idea of what deserves to be taught, that, like, American history, well, like, of course we should know American history, more so than, like, world history, even though, I don't know, like, I think I have the expectation that other people, like, understand American history. <laughs> like, you just expect that other people know, whereas, like, I don't know anything about, like, the structure of parliament, like, that's not something I feel like I'm expected to know. Right. Um, but that, like... Part of the reason why we want it, like an informed citizenry is for voting and like electing people into office, and part of that is that they make foreign policy decisions. Yeah. But like, I feel like it's not a understanding we have that like, oh, if we are deciding on our opinion on like what to do with this country, then we should know that country's history. Right. It's like just our own history. Right. Right. So part of the the. the you get a lot of articles, right, about our misinformation, our, our lack of knowledge about the Middle East in interventions that have been made in the Middle East, right? Uh, just understanding the kind of cultures that are there and the, the, the various um, expectations that they have, right? But thinking through what you're saying about I mean, one of the ways to think about civics, right? So one thing was we could say everybody should understand American civics, like American government, how it works, and so forth. You could also say, well, everybody ought to be able to, to think about civics in general by looking at the varieties of ways that governments work, uh, because that might actually enable you to have some scrutiny of the American civic system, right? And I want to just use that example to think about, uh, we talked about Perry Miller a bit before, right, uh, and, and the kind of influential role he had, this historian of the Puritans uh, in mid-20th century. Well, he also wrote about education. And, uh, I just want to use his, his sense of this tension here to think about um, one of the tensions that sort of underlies some of these questions that arise about what should be taught. So he says, one of the goals of education uh, in American society is often the sense of diffusion, that is, of making accessible, of bringing knowledge and out to people, right? So communicate it to people, train people up. Uh, education aims at the diffusion of information, the making of good citizens, a profound, he says, quote, a profoundly democratic conviction that the schools should be so conducted as automatically to produce exactly what America wants. So, if America wants more workers, schools should be the place to train those people to be more workers, right? Uh, this sense in which the schools produce what America needs or wants, uh, this diffusion, right? But he said, that's in tension with this other underlying sense of what education is basically about, which is discovery. That is, this sense in which education exists not just to pass things on, 
or to produce whatever it is that society already says it needs to produce, but to find out what we didn't know. In doing so, education has often faced the task, and this is his words again, of bestowing reputation upon unreputable ideas that it could not otherwise ignore. That is to say, educators do not just replicate society, they also change it. And this gets back to that question of, it's one thing to say every student should learn American civics so as to participate in American civil society. It's another thing to say every American should learn to set American civil society next to other civil societies in order to scrutinize the best way that government should be run. Right? The first of those is a kind of sense of diffusion. We need to train up citizens in this society. The second is a sense of discovery. We need to figure out what is the best possible system of government, which means nothing is free from scrutiny, right? Um, however much we might honor it, right? Uh, and that's, I think, one of these senses. Well, all of this matters because what we're talking about in this current, in this moment in the early 1800s is this idea of the increase of schooling, the increase of education, the rise of textbooks, and this general sense of what are those textbooks going to include? What are they going to educate people in, right? How do they produce the kind of informed citizenry that they need? Which brings us to Emma Willard. How many people have heard of Emma Willard? Anyone from New York? Emma Willard, anyone? Troy, New York? No, no, no? Ah, it's a shame, it's a shame. Uh, so, Emma Willard. This is great, actually, because um, I expected that, and I want to introduce you to Emma Willard. Uh, so who was she? She was this very innovative teacher, school founder, proponent of women's education, and textbook writer. Um, she was so famous in her own day... Well, first of all, the textbooks that she wrote sold over a million copies, which is a good payday, right? Um, so even though she founded uh, this school in Troy, New York, which is right near Albany, um, today called the Emma Willard School, uh, it still exists, it's a very good school, um, what she became most known for, in a certain sense, was her textbooks. Her History of the United States was reprinted 53 times over 45 years and translated into German and Spanish. Um, she was so well known that when she died in 1870, her death was reported. She had obituaries in Baltimore, Brooklyn, Boston, Charleston, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, San Francisco, and several other cities and towns. Everybody knew Emma Willard, right? Um, and in fact, her ideas for female education, she wrote this plan for female education, which she presented to the New York State Legislature in 1819. It's called The Plan, basically, in short. Uh, and, uh, and that's what sort of galvanized them, and eventually this led to the school she founded in Troy. But she also sent that plan all over, and in fact, in Bogota, in Colombia, Colombia they, they founded a, a seminary called a seminary school on her model, uh, and all over the place, right? So she was active in trying to get one established in, in Athens, Greece as well. So she was internationally famous too. Uh, so I've been to the Emma Willard School because I went there to read all of her papers, all of her letters, um, the stuff that she, there's a great... Uh, archive of her papers there. This is just, when you walk into the library at the school, this is just uh, a single copy of all the different um, editions of the books that she wrote. So these are all by Emma Willard in this cabinet. Um, so what's her argument for female education? I want to uh, kind of lay out the argument real quick and then show how it relates to these common concerns of the era. Her argument was basically that female education would not only make the nation great, it would make the nation last. Uh, Willard called on patriotic countrymen to follow her advice and establish a broad system of women's education in the consideration of national glory. What she was basically saying is, look, if you leave women only the genteel arts, right, only homemaking or whatever, um, you're basically uneducating half the population. You're leaving half the population as uninformed citizens. We need a fully informed citizenry. That includes the women. Now, what this argument... Um, reveals, which we, don't, we, need to, we need to think more about, right, is this, first of all, this sense. There were a lot of people still in the 18-teens and 1820s worried about whether this American republic was going to last. Look, all they had was the republics of history, and all of those republics had not lasted, <laughs> right? So mostly what they were thinking about was, how do we make this last as long as possible before it doesn't last anymore? Right? And basically what Emma Willard wants to say is, you make it last longer by educating the women, by making a fully informed citizenry. Um, and so lots of people saw education as absolutely essential to make the republic 
last. Um, now, she's influential in the model of female education that she develops and that spreads throughout the nation through her pupils who go and found schools themselves all across the country. So that's one thing uh, to know about her, but I'm not going to dwell on that. What I want to dwell on is her sense of history, how she goes about then writing history. One of the more f- famous things that she does is she brings to textbooks visualization. So think about the textbooks that you guys had in high school or whatever. You guys remember, like, they have these giant maps, right, uh, of America, and they have colored parts for this, uh, this kind of colonization, colored parts for that kind of colonization, for that group living there, for that group living there, right? Basically, the sense of developing history through maps, she starts that, right? Um, and so what she basically wants to say is, by the visual, students can grasp so much more of American history so much more quickly. In fact, she's so committed to this idea of just grasping the visual history of America that she tries to figure out, how can I make a single image that will be the whole history of America up to the present day? And this is the image she comes up with, a tree. Okay? So, a couple things to notice about this tree. First of all, you see left and right, it's the same kind of imagery you got on that membership in the Plymouth Society, right? Uh, the sort of uh, so-called native wilderness beforehand, uh, English town settlement after, right? Um, so it's the this, this sense of that kind of chronological development that she wants to tell. Well, what does each branch of this tree then do for her? Well, what it does for her is it establishes a turning point, right? And you'll see, I'll show you on the next slide, that a lot of this tree basically maps onto her table of contents. Um, And what she wants to say is, if you know the turning points of history, you're 90% there. The rest is filler, right? Basically, if you know the key moments... Everything else that happens in between the key moments is, you know, it's fine, right? Uh, And so what are the key moments? Well, of course, here it's very hard to read, I know, so I'm going to read it to you. This is Columbus's discovery, right, 1492. This is Gilbert's patent, Uh, so this beginning of exploration. Uh, And then here is 1620, Pilgrim's Landing. What's missing from the tree? What's not there? Jamestown, right? Done. We're not going to talk about the South, right? Uh, This is not a turning point in history, right? So even though it is the first permanent English settlement in America, for her, it's not a turning point. It's not a thing that every pupil has to remember, the beginning of Jamestown, right? Instead, what every pupil has to remember is the beginning of Plymouth, Pilgrim Landing, the Mayflower, right? And so what you get between here and here 1578 and 1620, in her textbook, is a whole bunch of accounts of uh, basic explorations and discoveries, including the Spanish and the Portuguese and the English and others, right, Dutch and so forth. So basically, Jamestown is, uh, gets wrapped up with the kind of finding of America. You found America, you begin America with the pilgrims, right? Uh, and that's how you can build into history all these turning points that allow you to move chronologically but assert origins at different moments, right? Now, I told you before I was going to give away my example. I gave my my example away a couple weeks ago, 1643. Does everybody remember now what that confederacy is? That was so important in the 19th century that everybody remembered it, that it was this turning point in history, the 1643 confederacy, that nobody remembers today. What happened in 1643? We talked about this two weeks ago. Who united? Who came together? What confederation? Yeah. It was, wasn't it like some of the New England colonies to fight against the Native Americans? Yes, correct, right? So four New England uh, colonies come together in 1643. They say we're going to unite for our common defense. And of course, this becomes, in the 19th century, one of the key turning points because it is one of those moments of union between the colonies that's prefiguring or looking forward to a much broader union of colonies that's going to come in uh, 1776, right? So, uh, so people are celebrating 1643 in the 19th century. Today, we don't remember it at all. This is how we think about public memory, cultural memory uh, changing over time. It doesn't remain static, right? 
Uh, collective remembering is a dynamic thing. Some things are remembered in one generation, forgotten in another generation uh, as unimportant. All right. Uh, so here you see the table of contents. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to here because this, again, draws out the sense uh, not just of confederation, but also the importance to Emma Willard of textual history, that the confederation, the compacts, are these various important texts that get written over time. So why is 1620 an important, what she calls, epoch uh, in American history? Landing of the pilgrims at Plymouth after having found on board the, uh, framed on board the Mayflower, the first written political compact of America. The first written political compact of America, right? If you call something first, you can, in a sense, erase anything else that has happened before, <laughs> right? By simply calling something the first. Uh, also, What's essential here is that she says it's the written compact. That's what matters, right? And again, this prefigures a written political social compact that's going to come later to frame the nation. These are how the stories of the nation are being written, right? So, just to review then, what do these epochs and origins allow her to do? Each is a break. Each break can be a possible beginning. So effectively, what it allows her to do is to say, yes, I'm moving chronologically through American history, but here are the moments to dwell on. Here's the origin of something new at each of these key t turning points, right? Columbus is a section to himself. Then the first epoch is this, um, this, these, all these discoveries. Jamestown is in the era of discovery, but it's not in the era of the first political compact of America, right? That starts with the pilgrims. All right, what does she say about these pilgrims? When they come, this is what she writes about them. On no part of the history of the United States, perhaps we may say of the world, does the eye of the philanthropist rest with more interest than on the account of the little devoted band now commonly spoken of under the touching appellation of the pilgrims. They possessed a much higher caste of moral elevation than any who had before sought the new world as a residence. Keep in mind how often we've seen this, right? Hello. Stay with us, electricity. Um, so this idea of moral elevation, right? They came here unlike anybody else, right? Uh, everybody else came for gold. These people came for God, right? That's this basic sense of, of contrast, right? The hope of gain was the motive of former settlers. The love of God was theirs. In their character and in their institutions, we behold the germ of that love of liberty. And I want you to uh, think about this for just a second, the germ of that love of liberty. There's built into this idea a sense of germs or of seeds that mature, Right? And we're going to see that again in Tocqueville next week. Okay? This idea of germs or seeds, that a nation is what it is in infancy and it just grows or matures into what it was planted as or began as. Right? Um, and those correct views of the national equality of man which are fully developed in the American Constitution. This is the origin, the pilgrims. Right? Uh, so you can see the way she's establishing that. So I said that she's very famous for introducing maps into American history. Well, here's you can see how it works. So this is her, her introductory map. Now, what's noteworthy about this map is that it's got, not called the first map of American history. It is the introduction. The, the first map is next, the second one. <laughs> right? So the introductory map is just basically a bunch of Native Americans. <laughs> right? So you can see the way in which this kind of history makes Native Americans into the backdrop against which the story begins. They're just part of the setting, right? This is just the setting. It's the introduction. This is what the world looked like before it began, right? Um, and you can see the way in which um, this kind of history maps very well onto the beginning of Genesis. Anyone know how Genesis begins? Anyone here? Spirit hovered over the void, right? Then God said, let there be light, right? There's this sense in which there's a void or a vacant land or an emptiness that is just waiting for order, waiting for something to arrive. That's how a lot of these 19th century histories of America are written, so that you have begun an introductory map and a kind of chaos, right? Turbulent waters in a certain sense, of all of these Native American tribes moving all over the place. There's no sense that any of these Native American tribes owns that part of the land, right? Or possesses that part of the land. Or that you would even be evicting them or, you know, taking over what they... Because they're, they, this is just void and movement, right? Uh, 
Uh, so this is an important map for thinking about how these histories incorporate Native Americans as a kind of setting or backdrop. So that the first map begins here. This is, again, Gilbert's patent, 1578, and begins with a written text, the patent, right, which is then inset on the map. This is where you get the, the coming of the pilgrims then, the second map. Uh, you get the Mayflower Compact up there, or the arrival, and uh, you get gradually more and more um, settlement on the East Coast. So you get the Pilgrim's Land at Plymouth. And then notice here, right? So between the maps, we've already looked at how she erases Jamestown from this history, right? More or less. She talks about them, but only in, in the sense in which they're not a founding, right? Well, that also means that they're not going to appear on any map. Because 1578, they're not there yet. So they can't be on that map. 1620, they're already there. But what does she say? And this is this is, uh, ship actually arrived in 1619, so close enough. Uh, she paints on the map a Dutch ship with Negroes from Africa purchased by the colony of Jamestown. So insofar as Jamestown appears on any map in her history, it appears as, as uh, associated with slavery, right? Which is why it's not a t she doesn't want it to be a turning point in American history. Because if it's the turning point in American history, you can't not talk about slavery, <laughs> Right? But if you say that the pilgrims came here for freedom, then you could first of all ignore the fact that pilgrims and Puritans in New England had slaves, which they did. Uh, and second of all, uh, you can say that that whole slavery business is not part of the essential identity of America. Right? That happened down south. The real origin is up here with this morally elevated crew of people who came. Right? Uh, so these histories are, are creating a kind of national story that's doing important kind of cultural work in creating that sense of a national identity. Uh, incidentally, I was just listening to lectures about the uh, American Revolution, which I do when I run sometimes. Sorry, I'm very nerdy that way. Uh, but they were talking about Jefferson's draft, of course, of the Declaration of Independence versus what eventually happens. And, of course, this very famous elimination. He charges the king with having forced on them the slave trade and so on, right? And there's people in Congress who feel a little tender about that, right? Especially folks from Georgia don't really want that in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, so they take, they take that stuff out. Um, but what Jefferson says about this is that it wasn't just Southerners who wanted that removed. It was Northerners who wanted that removed. Because why? They're the sea merchants who are making so much money on the slave trade. So when we think about slavery as, as a Southern institution we're forgetting the fact that it was very much a northern institution too, in particular through um, these merchants um, and sea vessels, but also in the fact that it existed uh, in Puritan New England. All right, so these maps go on and on. Then you get to this point, and you can see, uh, just let me just give you this sense. There's a lot of maps between here, but I just want to give you this sense of the gradual ordering Right? So if you think about, again, to go back to Genesis, what you have is void and then by the end of creation, order. Right? Now look at these maps. Here's the introductory map, then the first map, the second map, and a series of other maps, and then this. Right? You have this gradual sort of development of order out of chaos right? in the sense of the history. So this is 1789, the Constitution. And, of course, one of the notable features of this map is where's the western boundary, <laughs> right? Whoops. Uh, so you get this sense of a map that is not yet done being written, right? And you also get this sense that built into these Puritan roots or this pilgrim seed or whatever is a maturation that needs to continue, that needs to continue expanding. Uh, that expansion is sort of natural, to what it is. That when you come with a kind of morally elevated purpose of freedom, liberty, so, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that the natural thing for it to do is expand, right? Um, and you see that built into Webster's speech. You see that here. Now, what's so interesting is that in a certain way, the rhetoric takes over the speaker because the Whigs were not necessarily expansionists. The Democrats were, but not necessarily the Whigs, right? In fact, the annexation of Texas, there were a lot of New Englanders really opposed to it, in part because they thought it would give too much power to the slave powers, right? In other words, expansionism was not just a given in this culture. 
there were a lot of people opposed to or questioning the idea of American expansion. And yet, when they turned to this rhetoric of Puritan origins, of Pilgrim origins, of why they came, of this morally elevated rhetoric, then Webster sort of can't help himself but see it spreading to the Pacific. Because why would you not want that thing that's so good to spread, right? That's what it has to do. Um, that's, that's its sort of natural uh, trajectory. All right. So then that brings us to this guy, George Bancroft. I told you uh, the, the big prize in American history, if you win the big prize in American history, it's called the Bancroft Prize, right? After this guy, George Bancroft, who wrote 10 volumes of uh, U.S. history over the course of 40 years uh, and was sort of the major, especially at the beginning, the major authority on American history, right? Um, and his account of the pilgrims, which is very much like Willard's, um, gives you a sense of what is happening to this narrative as it's being developed. So this is again, oh, this is a Bancroft quote. As the pilgrims landed, their institutions were already perfected. Democratic liberty and independent Christian worship at once existed in America. Think about that as this sort of incredible origin story, right? What that sort of ignores is the fact that pilgrims and especially Puritans are working out church-state relations over the course of many years. There's nothing automatically formed when they land. They have to work it out. But working through all these sort of messy developments over time does not offer you a clean break, right? Last week, you guys were reading Rogers about exceptionalism, uh, and one of the versions of exceptionalism is a clean break, right? So the past is the past. This is something totally new. Here you get this sense of a clean break, right? This sense in which the moment they stepped ashore, everything was set in place. And all that could be done then is for it to grow, right? Uh, or for it to mature or spread. So you get this. Through scenes of gloom and misery, the pilgrims showed the way to an asylum for those who would go to the wilderness for the purity of religion or the liberty of conscience. Now, just think about, we read Reagan's farewell address at the beginning, right? How many echoes of Reagan's farewell address are already built into this language? And this is 1834, right? In the history of the world, many pages are devoted to commemorate the heroes who have besieged cities, subdued provinces, or overthrown empires. In the eye of reason and truth, a colony is better offering than a victory. The citizens of the United States should rather cherish the memory of those who founded a state on the basis of democratic liberty, the fathers of the country, the men who, as they first trod the soil of the new world, scattered the seminal principles of republican freedom and national independence. So notice that by the time of Bancroft, uh, this is what the pilgrims are, republican freedom and national independence. They are the o origins of that, right? Um, so this is the way in which the pilgrims begin to become nationalized at this moment into a story. And we're going to talk in two weeks, we're going to read O'Sullivan, Beecher, and other documents to think about that other aspect of Willard's map. That is, how do we get from that story to the spread of that story west? And what's the relationship between American exceptionalism and manifest destiny uh, and ideas such as that? All right? Uh, let me leave it there for just a second and ask if there's any questions about any of this that you guys want to talk about. So just to review on some of these important points. It takes mean, cultural means to build a history, right? A history doesn't just happen. It has to be written by somebody. It has to be spread in some kind of means. Um, that could be speeches, that could be memorials, it could be textbooks, it could be any number of things. Um, but it doesn't just happen, right? It has, there has to be these cultural intermediaries. And if the cultural intermediaries are from a certain section, highlighting the importance of that section to the nation becomes one of the sort of crucial features of that, right? So if all the historians were from Jamestown, what would our American history look like now? But most of the historians were from New England. So this idea of the importance of the Mayflower becomes sort of crucial to the whole thing. Any questions, any thoughts, any comments about all of this history business, textbooks business? Yeah. Uh, do you think that like the domination of the kind of Pilgrim Puritan narrative over uh, Jamestown was like a conscious um, 
effort, or do you think that was it just kind of happened naturally? Well, I think that two things. One, one, this this idea of, of a kind of local pride. So, so one of the things you see happening, right, is New England is not only losing out in population, but they're losing out in political significance. Four out of the first five presidents are from the South, right, from Virginia. So, they're not getting the political significance they feel they deserve, right? So in a certain sense, they, could, they can give themselves the national significance of the his, history, right? Yeah, the presidents come from down there, but the nation comes from up here, right? What it really stands for comes from up here. So you see this sort of, it's, there's a kind of compensation. I also think, so Emma Willard specifically calls uh, the Virginians, she has a section called Bad Settlers, and that's about Virginia, <laughs> right? <laughs> So, yeah, I think there's something conscious about the idea that she doesn't like what they did down there. And if America stands for that, then that's not really a nation you want to stand for yourself, right? So you, if you could kind of kind of talk about it in a way to move on from it and, and ignore it or say, you know, that's, that happened, but that's not what we really, that's not the crucial thing that happened, right? The origin is really up here, yeah. If the textbooks had been written by Southerners, the ardent supporters of slavery, do you think they would have consciously left out the Jamestown narrative? Because it would seem pretty hypocritical. Well, who knows, right? Yeah, these, these counterfactuals of, of thinking about what if, what if the South had this, inc- this writing culture of history uh, and the North didn't? What would, what would have changed or how would it look differently? It's hard to know exactly, right? Um, but the fact is, you know, one of the reasons why the Puritans became such a, a you know, in, in my mind, fascinating culture is partly because they wrote everything down. Like, they were just incessant about writing, right? Including their own history, but records, church records, everything, right? And within a decade of the Puritans coming, they've got a printing press because this is crucial to them, right? They've got a, they've got a college and a printing press within a decade, of getting here. A decade, that's like crazy, right? Uh, this doesn't happen in the South, right? Uh, and so one of the reasons is just, there's just so much more written. And if you're looking for the sources, right? Perry Miller says, uh, I started with the articulate beginning and it was articulate because it was written down basically, right? I mean, he's, he's sort of conscious about what he's doing when he says Virginia doesn't matter, the Puritans matter, why do they matter? Because they wrote it down. But that's, of course, tautological, right, um, in the sense that he thinks about them because they wrote, right? Um, all right, any other last questions or comments for today? Okay, I want to leave a little time to hand back your papers, uh, and we'll wrap it up. We'll read uh, William Apis and Frederick Douglass for Thursday, and then we'll get into Tocqueville next week. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. C-SPAN has a new podcast, Presidential Recordings. During the first season, C-SPAN shares private phone calls between President Lyndon Johnson and members of his administration, Congress, and even his own family. Presidential Recordings. Find it and follow it wherever you listen to podcasts.